Hello and welcome to another training on demand. This one is going to be a little more operational in nature. We're going to talk about being an incident commander, some of the things that uh, come to be when you're the incident commander. Uh, we're talking about structural fires here. So one of the things we're talking about is, uh, you know, the, the much talked about topic of size up. You know, size up is, uh, you know, I don't know, it's talked about, but I'm not sure how much it's performed. We're going to kind of review these topics and then we're going to do a real life situation here in just a couple minutes to uh, see what we can talk about. So life has it, you know, that's what we're here for. Right? It's all about the life hazard. And the life hazard is the people we serve. Right? It's the civilians. It's the known trapped. We'll talk about a rescue profile in a later episode. But right now we're talking about the life hazard. That is the people that we're there to rescue or uh, attempt to create a positive impact for. When I say the word occupancy, I'm not talking about the number of occupants to the building. I'm talking about what is the building used for. What occupancy? What is it? Is it a school, a single-family residence, a multi-family residence, a business, a manufacturing, a warehouse? That's what the occupancy is. Special matters. This is one that kind of um, is a nebulous in a lot of ways. Um, what is special matters? Well, special matters is this. You pull up in front and there's high tension wires, there's electrical power lines right in front of the building. You can't get the ladder company or the truck company in where you want it. Special matters. There's something amiss. There's a code violation. It's been subdivided. There's propane in the building. Uh, there's um, hazardous materials in the building. It's a drug house. It's a meth lab. Things that you can't control, which you are not likely to know ahead of time, but you are really likely to know once you arrive. So they, they must be considered, they must be dealt with without question. Exposures, pretty simple. It's uh, the internal exposures, you know, fires in the living room, kitchen's an exposure, second floor is an exposure, an auto exposure, and then of course there's the exposures, you know, all four sides. There's six sides to every fire, right? Four sides, you know, horizontally and top and bottom. So exposures are everywhere. It's something that we have to consider uh, wherever we're uh, uh, operating on a fire situation. Weather is kind of twofold. Weather really deals with the fact that it's weather that's affecting the fire, that is wind, um, you know, cold, blah, 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 all of the things that weather brings. And it's also how weather affects our personnel, our reflex time, our ability to respond, our ability to last. You know, is it high humidity, extremely high temperature? We need more crews. We need whatever it is. Um, the next one is, you know, and I put these together. So I put height and area together. For a lot of reasons, you know, it's lattice, it's hose line, it's the volume of the fire. More importantly, in today's day and age, as we well know, it's the volume of the air. What is the amount of air that's uh, uh, contributing to the spread and development of this fire? Um, those are things that go together, must be considered. Time. So it's time of day, time of the week. Time of the year, quite frankly, are all, you know, um, contributing factors. I worked in an area that had an urban um, retail strip, if you will. You know, after Black Friday and Thanksgiving, response time was incredibly uh, compromised because of all the retail outlets and the traffic and the volume of the whatever. So time of year became an issue. Time of the week, you know, this, the church is probably not occupied on Wednesday afternoon. It could be, but it probably isn't. Um, the school is not occupied in the summer. Time has a factor on all of us. You know, something that must be highlighted all the time is construction. You know, uh, Frank Brannigan said it best. My friend Chris Norm is doing a ton of work in this area. 
Construction of the building, it's where we operate. It's where we decide to operate. It's where we determine how long we can operate. It's all of those things that involve the building. It's where we work. It is our workplace. Pay attention to that and understand that and study it every day. Engineering methods, engineered lumber, construction standards are all changing. Uh, be a student. Be a student of construction. You're going to make your people safer. You're going to operate safer and whatever. And so the other one is uh, location. And I have to say, it's the location of the fire. Um, so it's, it's the location of the fire within the building. I don't mean that the fire is on Maple Street. I mean it's the location of the fire in the building. It determines how we operate. It determines what we do. It determines all the things that are involved in that. Fire in a basement is different from fire on floor three. It, it changes the way we operate. It changes our ability to access the room of origin. Um, there's a lot of things that go to deal with that, but it, it, when I say location in this context, I'm talking about the location of the fire. Apparatus and manpower, it's pretty simple. It's a resource game. It's a resource game. We need to figure out what resources we have and what's our ability to manage this situation. You know, one of the greatest things in, in incident command, the ICS system, is in the planning section, it's restat, sit stat. What is the situation status? What is the resource status? Do I have enough stuff to do what it is I'm trying to do? What is the situation called for and do I have enough stuff? It is the plague of what's going on in the American Fire Service today. We try to operate before we have enough resources in place and we're always being cut economically because of resources, manpower, vehicles, equipment, blah, blah, blah. So apparatus and manpower clearly affects what we're doing. Water supply, I think, is pretty simple. It takes water to do this job. You know, in today's day and age, I think you're making a mistake if you're not using enhanced water that is putting something in your stream. I think you uh, need to think about that. It, it helps us in a lot of ways. But I think these are the points that we're going to talk about, and I just want to set the stage with you as we begin to look at this very first scenario that we're going to look at. We're going to consider these points, but I wanted to lay the foundation for what these points are. So here we are. What, what is the life hazard or the potential life hazard of this situation. I think we see that um, we've got a fire. Uh, we've got a fire in a first floor area. We've got a fire that's in a taxpayer building. So you know what, as we begin to check off the blocks here a little bit, um, what is the life hazard? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a daytime fire. This is, uh, this is an occupancy that's um, clearly occupied. There are vehicles in place. There are offices above some sort of establishments, commercial on the first floor. Fire it looks to be exterior, but I can't be sure. Uh, clearly, there's some smoke upstairs. So we're talking about the occupancy as well. Uh, I think the occupancy here is uh, interesting because it's a dry cleaner. Uh, there's fire under the overhang, uh, whatever. Um, clearly some issues that become a factor. Um, you know, we talk about the special matters. Um, what are those special matters? Well, we've got some rooftop stuff. Um, we've got some construction issues, the age of the building. we got certainly a traffic pattern, um, you know, a, a, a two-lane highway. we got some access problems certainly in here. Uh, we got a lot of things going on in this situation. So I'm not sure if this was an exterior fire, uh, maybe from that van, uh, not sure what happened. Um, but we've got some issues that clearly uh, have involved the building, and we, we've got some smoke conditions, second floor or what have you. What's the exposures? Well, you know, listen, it's, uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist here. You've got exposures here, here, all the way across the top and you've got exposures all the way across this first floor. 
there's no question that you have serious, serious exposure concerns in this situation in a lot of areas. You know, we talked about, we talked about the weather. Um, I don't think that's a big deal in this uh, factor. Smoke's not moving in a direction, doesn't look like it, looks like a nice day, don't know what the temperature is, don't really care. But I don't think weather is a real big deal here as it, as it relates. I did say that I like to put two things together, um, and that is height and area. I think that those two are relative, and I like to group them in my mind certainly as I go. So as we begin to think about that, what is the length of the stretch? What is the length of the stretch? We don't have a good sense of what's the depth here, but how much hose is it going to take you to get where you need to go? Uh, what is the volume of fire? Are there real firewalls in place, or is there just merely uh, token separations? Um, I don't know. I don't know what this is. You know, as you begin to look at that, what is this? Is this a real separation or is it not a real separation? I think that matters. I think we need to pay attention to that. As I talk about the separation with height and area, you know, we begin to think about um, the time. We talked about, let me just fix that because that's pretty sloppy and it's not a good thing. So let's talk about the time. And, you know, it could be any time. It's a daytime situation. Business is operating. Things are going on the way they should be going on. Time of day may not be crucial in this particular situation, uh, other than the fact that we know that it's occupied. Height and area took us to the construction piece, um, and we know that this building is probably... You know, it could be as early as the 70s, maybe even sooner. you got to think about lots of renovations. you got to think about a lot of things going on here. And you got to think about an older building that certainly has void spaces with a lot of potential spread. There's no question. As you begin to look at, um, you know, a lot of the things, where are you going, how are you going to handle this, and how are you going to manage it? Um, Location of the fire. Well, location of the fire in this case appears to be ground level. It clearly appears to be extended. You know, the fire is going to run that canopy under dry cleaners. In a couple of seconds, minutes, it's going to be under the dollar plus, the religious supplies, the family doctor, the all care center, and anything. That's going to run horizontally pretty quickly. And you're clearly superheating the floor above. It's It clearly looks like it's... Uh, Expend, extended up there in some degree for sure, without question. Um, apparatus, well, I think that you got to put in your own apparatus. The question is, what do you respond with and what would you call? What do you need? You know, I know what you'll go with. You figure that out in your department. But really, what do you need to call to make this thing worthwhile and make this thing a successful outcome? Restat sits to that for sure. And water supply. I don't know if you're in a rural water supply area, if you're in a hydrogen area, or what you need to do, but just kind of looking and making an assessment here. Now, pretty quickly, you know, just my thoughts on this. I think you need a couple of lines. I think you got to get upstairs pretty quickly. You need a lot of resources. In my world, you know, we it, it, on my best days, I had 13 people responding. On my worst days, I had eight. You know, you clearly need a second or a third alarm here to get people uh, to search these upper floors, clear these adjacent businesses, and get in there pretty aggressively, not to do overhaul, but to create some inspection holes so that you can actually figure out where this thing is traveling. I think the travel and fire spread is going to be a big deal here, and that's what you need to think about. So this is kind of a simple review of a small taxpayer fire to figure out um, how you would look at it, or to kind of let you know how I would look at it in this particular situation. 
If you got questions, if you don't understand what I said, if you like more, if you think this is a good idea or a bad idea, please reach out. Feel free to contact me at pete at petelam.com. I'd love your feedback. I'd love to know what you're thinking. And uh, let me know if this training on demand is working for you in your department and, more importantly, how you're using it. If you need me to show up in person, you need me to do a live session with your crew, I'm able to do that. Please reach out to me at pete at petelam.com. This has been another session of Training on Demand. This is an operational section, and it's something we want to share with you, and hopefully this has some meaning and some value to you as we move forward.